Okay, introducing our president, Heidi Leonard. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third seminar of the Mid-Atlantic Micro-Nano Alliance virtual seminar series. I'm Heidi Leonard, here virtually with co-president Ryan Sokol. Ryan, take it away. All right, so today we have a talk from Sonia LeBlanc. Uh, she is an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at the University of uh, the George Washington University. Her research goals are to create next generation energy conversion technologies with advanced materials and manufacturing techniques. Previously, she was a research scientist at a startup company where she created research development and manufacturing characterization solutions for thermoelectronic, uh, thermoelectric technologies and evaluated the potential of new power generation materials. Uh, Dr. LeBlanc obtained a PhD in mechanical engineering with a minor in material science at Stanford University. She was a Churchill scholar at the University of Cambridge where she received a master's degree in engineering. And she has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from uh, the Georgian Institute of Technology. Before pursuing a PhD, Dr. LeBlanc served in Teach for America and taught high school math and science in Washington, DC. In 2018, the American Society of Engineering Education named her one of its 20 under 40 high achieving researchers and ed educators. And Dr. LeBlanc received the National Science Foundation's Career Award in 2020. Dr. LeBlanc. Great, thank you, Ryan and Heidi. I'm excited to be here with you and um, our audience um, out in the virtual space. Um, I today I'm going to talk about a subset of the work um, that we do in our group and hopefully it's relevant for the audience that is um, joining us today. Um, so I'll talk about re-envisioning direct heat to electricity conversion with additive manufacturing. Um, and I'm going to start off by just giving an overview of um, what my group does. So in my group, uh, we create energy conversion solutions using advanced materials and manufacturing techniques. Um, my group focuses on energy, providing energy solutions. Uh, and so we do that in three ways. Um, we do that through working on manufacturing and novel materials for energy conversion systems. Um, we model and design and build energy devices and systems. And finally, we do techno-economic analyses that allow us to understand how new energy technologies would actually be able to penetrate into a commercial market, um, for example. And so while we focus on all of those as a part of providing energy solutions, today I'm going to focus on one of our projects um, related to the work that we do in manufacturing and novel materials. So I want to start off by providing the motivation um, for why I think this work is important and um, why I, I am so excited to work in energy. Um, so this is a, a complicated plot that you see um, in front of you. It's actually updated every year by the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, um, which is funded by the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, so this is updated every year. The latest one that I was able to pull um, was for 2018. And what it does is it tracks our um, energy resources. So where we get our energy from, all those resources, and that's what's on the left side of the screen. Um, and it tracks how we use those energy resources. So we use some of them for electricity generation, we use it for residential, commercial, industrial, um, and transportation applications. And then what I think is so great um, about how these energy resources are tracked is on the far right, we actually see how much of those energy resources were used for the energy services, the reason that we use those energy resources in the first place, and then how much is actually rejected. Um, so energy that we don't end up using for the services, but we had to consume from the resource in order to get the services. Um, so for folks who have a background in thermodynamics, you'll understand um, that this happens because we don't have any process that's 100% efficient. Right. So what I think is so interesting about this is that the majority of those energy resources actually gets rejected, um, which I find fascinating. We go to a lot of work to actually access these energy resources, and then the majority of that energy gets rejected. And it turns out that the majority of that rejected energy is rejected as heat. Um, 
I find this incredibly motivating. I'm very interested in, in what heat does um, and what we can do with heat. And so the fact that we are rejecting the majority of our energy resources as heat means to me that we need to think about how to maybe make our systems more efficient and not produce that heat or and how to convert that heat into a form of energy that we might be more interested in using. And that brings me to the technology that we focus on quite a bit in my group, which is thermoelectric energy conversion. And thermoelectric conversion is a direct conversion of heat into electricity. Right? You can also supply electricity and pump heat, so make something hot um, or make it cold. Um, and so for, I'm aiming this talk um, for folks who maybe have no background in thermal electrics um, and, and maybe don't know about different types of um, manufacturing and, and micro and nanostructuring. But if you do have more of a background in those areas and are interested in delving into some of the finer details of, of what I'll be talking about, about the technologies um, and our results, I encourage you to contact me after the talk um, or go to my website and you can find some of the more detailed aspects of, of what we're doing here. But I'm going to target this to a, a broader audience um, to hopefully kind of keep you engaged, even if you're not familiar with these technologies. Um, so thermoelectric energy conversion allows us to do this conversion between heat and electricity um, in solid state. And that means that these devices don't have any moving parts. Um, the thermoelectric, the active thermoelectric material that does this conversion is typically a semiconductor um, material. And um, in a device like the schematic that you see on the screen in front of you, um, we usually use an N-type and a P-type semiconductor together. And thermoelectrics and the figure of merit that kind of tells us how effective this material is, is called VT. Um, and the, so in ZT, we have uh, three material properties. We have the Seebeck coefficient, which tells us how much electrical potential, how much voltage we could get for a temperature gradient that's across the material. We have the electrical conductivity, which is how effectively electrons move through the material. And we have the thermal conductivity, which is how effectively heat moves through the material. Um, so what this tells us is that for good thermoelectric material, we need good charge transport, and we need to minimize the thermal energy carrier transport, right? That's what the figure of merit tells us. Um, so I want to give you some examples of thermoelectrics um, applications. Um, so in power generation, which is um, converting thermal energy directly into electrical energy, um, where we have seen thermoelectrics used has primarily been um, for powering space vehicles. So the decay of a radioisotope provides the heat source, and then a thermoelectric is around the outside of that isotope. And so one side of the thermoelectric is hot. Um, there's a gradient in temperature across that thermoelectric that gives rise to an electrical potential. You connect it to a circuit and you get electricity. And so because that radioisotope, um, that decay is such a long lifetime, this is a really long lifetime heat source. So you have this long lifetime heat source that is powering the thermoelectric um, that's creating, um, that's generating the electricity from that heat. It's converting the heat into electricity. So this is used um, to power space vehicles because it's such a, a reliable way um, of producing electricity. On a smaller scale, and if you've ever seen a thermoelectric, this is probably um, the scale at which you've seen it, you can buy these thermoelectric modules off the shelf. And um, what a lot of people will do is they'll use it for heating and cooling. So you'll connect it to some kind of power source and you can pump heat um, across it so that one side will get hot, the other side will get cold. So you can have very localized um, heating and cooling. So for example, this is actually used um, in some car seats. Um, so in the in, the, in a vehicle um, in the seat, um, if you have a, a seat warmer, sometimes um, those seat warmers are made out of thermoelectrics. But I wanna get you to think about potential applications um, for using thermoelectrics in the future. And, and this is what I find really motivating when we think about how we're using our energy resources. We actually have a lot of applications where um, there is a significant amount of waste heat. So in industrial processes, particularly where we're processing materials like metals um, and ceramics, 
there's a, a lot of heat is required um, for that processing. And so there ends up being a lot of waste heat present in that kind of process kind of processing. And we have a lot of combustion appliances um, that are burning some kind of fuel um, and we use that heat, but there's a significant amount of that energy that we're not using. Um, one example is in um, automotive exhaust heat. And so um, in automobiles, only about 20 to 30%, so this is for internal combustion um, vehicles, not electric vehicles, um, but only 20 to 30 percent um, of the energy in that gasoline actually goes to moving your vehicle um, and powering the things inside your vehicle. Um, a significant amount of the energy that's actually in that gasoline is just um, converted into heat um, and, and goes out of the vehicle as heat. Um, and so converting that to electricity on board um, could be useful for reducing the load on the alternator, um, for example. And, and powering all the electronics in the vehicles. Um, there's another interesting application that folks have, ex have explored, which is using your body heat to power electronics um, that you might have on your body or in your body. Um, so what I'm interested in is how do we actually move from the limited current um, examples of thermoelectric applications to this really interesting set of possible future applications for thermoelectrics. And it turns out that that requires um, new solutions in materials and manufacturing. I mean, it requires understanding the applications that thermoelectrics will go into. Um, so I'm going to first touch on the material side of it. Um, this uh, audience might be really interested in the impact of nanostructuring, so I'm going to hit on that first. If we look at the figure of merit um, for thermoelectrics, the numerator of this tells us about um, what's happening with electrons in the material. So you want this figure of merit to be larger, you want the numerator um, to be higher, so you want a high Seebeck coefficient, high electrical conductivity. And then one of the really interesting um, uh, findings has shown that if you nanostructure um, the material, um, and so you can nanostructure the material, you'll change what's called the density of states, um, which is where electrons can be um, in the material. Um, and changing that density of states actually allows you to increase um, this numerator. Um, primarily, you can you have a significant change in the slope of the density of states, um, and you can increase that Seebeck coefficient. Um, so working on nano structuring the material can increase the numerator um, of this figure of merit that tells us how good thermoelectrics are. But we can also think about decreasing the denominator. So how do we reduce the thermal conductivity? Um, and that can actually also be done um, through nanostructuring the material. And so the, the way we do that is by changing what's called the mean free path of the, the carriers that carry heat through the material. Um, and we can do that uh, for folks who, who are unfamiliar with this. I'm just going to kind of summarize what we do here um, and try to, to try to make it understandable. Um, but, but we have these uh, vibrations of the atoms um, in the material that actually carry heat through the material. Um, and those are called phonons, these lattice vibrations. And so if we introduce um, features into the material that can impact how the phonons go through the material, if they kind of act as barriers that the phonons can bounce off of, um, that changes the mean free path. So it changes how far this phonon can go um, before it scatters and, and kind of has to go in another direction. Um, and that means that it can actually reduce the thermal conductivity. Um, so these are the ways that we think about how we can actually change thermoelectric materials. So on this slide, I'm going to show some um, structures. So these are diagrams that show you where the atoms are. Um, so unit cell diagrams shows you where the atoms are in different kinds of thermoelectric materials. Um, and the reason I'm showing this to you is just to show you that where the atoms are placed in this material strongly impacts um, the ability of these energy carriers to move through the material. So we think about engineering the material by engineering where the atoms are so that we can affect how energy moves through the material. So we can do it by thinking about the placement um, of atoms in the unit cell, 
Um, but we can also think about doing it by nanostructuring the material um, through physical or chemical mechanisms. So we can make the material into nanowires. Um, we can grind it up until the features of the material um, are small enough that they would impact um, the carrier transport. Um, or we can even build it up layer by layer where we're controlling the structure um, at a very, very small scale. So we can, you know, we've seen this already done with nanowires, um, bulk uh, nanoparticle materials, um, and super lattice materials, where all of those materials are, are ones where nanostructuring has been done to improve the material um, figure of merit. Um, but I want to step back. I'm a mechanical engineer, um, and so I really like to think about where these materials go and the kinds of systems that they go into. Um, and so I, I actually, instead of thinking about it kind of bottom up, I often think about it from the application um, back. And so when we think about um, thermoelectrics, the potential applications are these, um, these places where you have a, you know, some hot surface, but those can be really difficult to get to, right? They're curved surfaces, um, they're, they're in really unique form factors, um, and it's hard to figure out how you're gonna get a thermoelectric device, which is very planar, into those applications that might have a lot of curved spaces. And so instead of just thinking about the material properties, we have to think about um, the extrinsic properties. So how the geometry of the device from a system level perspective um, impacts the performance of the device. And so um, what some of us like to think about is this system level VT, where we don't consider only the material properties, but we also consider the geometry of the device and how the geometry impacts the performance of the device. Okay? And so what you could see from the previous slide is that where the devices go doesn't really align well to having these very planar rigid devices. Um, and so what my group works on is thinking about a totally different way to make these thermoelectric devices. And so I'm going to talk you through um, very quickly how these devices are made um, currently, the traditional device, so you can understand why we're thinking about doing it a different way. So typically, these materials um, are made into an ingot, and that ingot is diced and metallized, and you get these small kind of cuboid-shaped legs. Um, and those are um, placed onto electrical connectors and then it's all um, sandwiched together. And so this manufacturing process leads to really limited geometries. Basically that thermoelectric module geometry that you see in the upper right of the slide is how most of them look, regardless of how the application is, what, what a, whether the application is some curved hot pipe that you wanna put the device on. Um, also, this uh, manufacturing process leads to significant material loss. So over 50% of the material can be lost through all of these dicing steps. And then because you're having to attach these legs into the, the module, um, there are a lot of interface and integration challenges for integrating thermoelectric materials into the module and making it so that those interfaces don't contribute significantly to parasitic thermal and electrical resistances. Also, you have a lot of these tiny legs um, that are getting assembled into a larger area device. And so the, the processing can be challenging to try to get all those legs into this larger device and place these tiny things onto all of those electrical connectors. So this manufacturing approach um, is really not conducive to the kinds of systems that we want to um, put thermoelectrics in or the kinds of um, performance that we wanna get out of the devices. Um, so our group completely rethought how you would make a thermoelectric, and we thought, okay, if, if we don't pay attention really to how they're made now, and we thought about what we would do if we made kind of the best thermoelectric um, device, how would we do it? So from a materials perspective, we would want a technique that would allow us to engineer the material composition and control the material structure all the way from the nanoscale up to the mesoscale. From a manufacturing perspective, we want a technique that would allow us to make new tunable device geometries that weren't limited to these kind of cuboid um, discrete legs. 
And we'd like to eliminate the assembly steps and um, that can be problematic in, in making these kinds of devices. And then lastly, when we think about system integration, we'd like to build thermal electric materials and devices directly into the system level components and try to eliminate all of these other system components. Um, and we'd like to be able to engineer the interfaces bet between the materials and components to reduce the parasitics that bring down the overall device um, performance. And so this was kind of a pie in the sky vision. Um, and we thought if we could do that, we could completely rethink the thermoelectric module and we could make these sheets of thermoelectric materials or bricks of thermoelectric materials um, with hierarchical structuring and engineered composition. And that would allow us to have integrated power generation and thermal management. Um, panels or bricks. And so the idea here is that if we could completely rethink the way we make thermoelectrics, we could actually make tiles or bricks that you could build something like an aircraft, um, for example, out of, and that structural material inside of it would actually be able to provide thermal management, so it could heat or cool, um, or it could convert heat into electricity inside of the structural material. So that's the vision we have. How would you go about doing that? We spent some time thinking about it, and we actually ended up um, coming to additive manufacturing as a potential manufacturing solution um, that could do this. And we looked at different additive manufacturing techniques and settled on a technique that's called laser powder bed fusion, um, where uh, material parts are made layer by layer um, by laying down a layer of powder and melting it in a certain pattern. It solidifies and then you build up a part um, layer by layer. So this is a, um, a 3D printing technique, um, if you will, um, in kind of layman's terms, um, that is used on, on primarily materials like metals and, and ceramics. And so this technique can give um, strong, lightweight, customized parts with small, complex features. And so we thought that this was um, very conducive to being able to do what we wanted to do with thermoelectrics. Um, the benefit here is that um, if we were to make different thermoelectric unit geometries um, with this technique, um, and we can compare really simple geometry. So additive manufacturing would allow us to make layered structures or have structures where the interior is hollow, as opposed to this one that's circled right now, which is the traditional just cuboid type of, type of leg. And what we found is that larger temperature gradients will occur across units that have these hollow or layered geometries and that you can get a 35 to 55% higher aerial power density for those layered or hollow geometries that you could create with additive manufacturing. And so we're really excited about moving forward with um, additive manufacturing. And um, when we looked at the work going on in laser powder bed fusion, um, folks who might be familiar with that are familiar with it being used for metals. Uh, so typically, you know, in metals, um, the, the column on the left shows you the characteristics um, for, for metal materials. So they, the thermal dissipation is higher because the thermal conductivity of the material is higher. Um, the material itself is ductile, and you can get the starting powder material um, in the form factor that you see in the um, scanning electron micrograph uh, at the bottom, where the, the particles are round, they're spherical, and so you have decent amount of flowability, the ability of moving that powder. With thermoelectric materials, it's kind of different. So these are semiconductor materials um, that are designed for the thermal dissipation to be low. We want a low thermal conductivity. Um, and the materials, they're mechanically more like a ceramic. So they're brittle materials. And then you can see, see an example of a, um, a scanning electron micrograph in the bottom right there. These are non-spherical powders. So um, they're, they're ones where when you can start with the, the starting material, um, it's not spherical. So we worked with different thermoelectric materials um, to do this additive manufacturing technique. We've worked with the traditional calcogenide, which is a bismuth telluride that is used in uh, the commercial thermoelectric modules that you might buy off the shelf. Um, we worked with half poisoner materials and um, silicide materials as well. And what you see on the right there is some images of what these powders look like. So they're not typical powders. 
Um, and because we were working with really novel materials, um, what we ended up having to do is build our own laser additive manufacturing system. So um, in our lab, we've built our own custom laser additive manufacturing system um, that has a continuous wave laser and varial power up to 100 watts. Um, and it, it just like a commercial system, it has a scanning system that allows us to scan the laser um, across a powder bed underneath it. And all of this is inside um, of a flexible laser welding enclosure that actually allows us to um, do our processing in an inert gas environment. Um, and so I'm going to jump right to the chase. You know, after a, a lot of uh, kind of research work to figure out how to make this happen, um, we have been able to build up parts um, out of thermoelectric material. Um, so you see here um, a, a part that is um, eight millimeters um, wide for the disc and three millimeters wide for this kind of bar structure. Um, and we've gotten parts that are um, about 85% uh, relative density. So, you know, somewhat porous, um, but uh, a decent um, density for some uh, initial parts. What's really interesting about this, though, is that with traditional thermoelectric manufacturing, you can't make unique geometries. You kind of just are stuck with something that is just this um, disc shape or this bar shape. But because we're using the additive manufacturing technique, we can make a unique geometry. So the traditional thermoelectric manufacturing techniques, it's very hard to make this kind of curvy S-shaped structure um, that you see in the bottom right. But with the laser additive manufacturing technique, it's fairly simple to do that. So we're really excited that we we're able to show this um, on thermoelectric materials. Now, the audience for this seminar might be particularly interested in what happens um, at the micro and nano level when you do this laser additive manufacturing process on um, thermoelectric materials. And so I'll show you um, some images of the um, microstructure. So on the left-hand side, um, this is a mat thermoelectric material that is um, melt-grown, so that it, it's made with one of the very traditional techniques for making thermoelectric material ingots. Um, so you can see with the, the melt-grown um, material, you have these more equiax grains that are distributed. On the right-hand side, you see a micrograph of our laser processed um, material. So when we have built up this material layer by layer using this laser additive manufacturing process. And what you see there is these really long columnar grains that go um, through the through thickness of the laser additive manufacturing part. So what this tells you in short is that doing this laser processing can allow you to control the microstructure of the material. That's really fascinating because if you think back to the beginning of the talk, I talked about how the structuring impacts the way carriers move through the material. It actually impacts the thermoelectric properties. So here we have a way where not only we could make a unique device structure um, that you can't make through the typical manufacturing techniques for thermoelectrics, but we could also control the structuring at the micro scale. Um, so that's really interesting. Um, we also have looked at how the structuring um, impacts um, the phase of so the orientation of those unit cells um, in the material. And we see that with the laser processing material, um, you do get a preferred orientation. So this is really interesting because this processing um, gives us results that are very different from the traditionally processed material and understanding how we can control the process and the resulting structure allows us to maybe tune the way the material would behave um, thermally, electrically, and mechanically. Um, and so we do, we kind of develop that understanding uh, by building multi-physics models um, that allow us to understand what the temperature gradient is in the material while it's being processed. Um, and we connect that understanding with the structure that develops in the material. So we understand the, the, the temperature gradients, um, how those gradients change over time, and we can look at the structuring that develops in the material. Um, 
And then finally, what we do is we look at the transport property. So we look at how does it affect the CBAC coefficient, which is this critical material property um, for the material. And what we found in our early studies is that um, it actually really changes. Um, it can really change the CBAC coefficient. So um, on the, the kind of pinkish um, ones on the right are showing um, the, um, the traditionally melt grown materials. Um, and then the, the ones in the black um, on the left are the, the laser processed materials. And what we see is that the CBEC coefficient is a different sign. What that tells us is that we're starting out with a material that even though traditionally it's an N-type material, when we laser process it, it's a P-type material. Um, so it has a positive CBEC coefficient. And what we find that is that as we change the temperature, the material that starts as a p-type material, um, if you increase the temperature, you're increasing the number of donors, and it eventually then does transition to an n-type material. And what that tells us is that something is happening during laser processing that's impacting the structuring that then impacts how the carriers move through the material. It's changing the transport of the electrons um, through that material. And so um, we thought, oh, okay, maybe it's changing the phase of the material. Um, but what's really interesting is if you look at the um, X-ray diffraction results, um, the original material, which is the, um, the, the one in the middle that, that's the starting material actually lines up with the laser processed material. Um, and so what we see is that the phase is actually preserved during laser processing. We're not changing the material phase. And so the change in transport property must be coming from something that's other than a, a change in phase or a change in phase that can be detected from um, X-ray diffraction um, conducted on, on the entire material. And so that leads us to having to look at the nanostructure. There's something in the nanostructuring of the material that happens when you laser process it that must be impacting um, the transport properties. And so what we have found in our preliminary work in characterizing the nanostructure is that um, you can't pick it up on X-ray diffraction, but if you look in, um, you look at the material with a transmission electron microscope, you can see that there are indeed these um, oxide inclusions, these bismuth oxide inclusions that um, that form in the material, um, and the density is low enough that you're, you don't pick it up on on X-ray diffraction, um, but they are indeed there, and the, the the presence of them is enough to actually change transport of character carriers. Um, and then we also, you know, are from the ability to characterize the nanostructure, get to see um, that there are these really interesting um, results of what's happening at the nanoscale in the material, particularly, for example, at the grain boundaries. Um, and so the, the way the lattice transitions across grain boundaries is going to impact the carrier of transport, so phonons and electrons to that material, which means it's going to um, impact the thermoelectric property. And so this is really exciting for us because we see that when you do the laser um, additive manufacturing, you can create meso and macro scale structures that are more beneficial at a device and system level, but you can also influence the nano and microstructure. And so we can think about controlling the mechanical and thermal and electrical properties um, in a way that we're not able to through traditional manufacturing. So we're really excited um, about this work and um, you know, we, we have this vision of how we can actually transform the way thermoelectrics are made and think about engineering them at multiple length scales. Um, we've been able to show that additive manufacturing could actually get you to structures that are more beneficial for thermoelectric performance. Um, we've decided to move forward with using a laser additive manufacturing technique called laser powder bed fusion. And so that's the technique that we're using in our group. And we explore how this technique allows us to create unique structures um, at, the micro, uh, at the macro and uh, meso scale, but also at the micro and nano scale. And we know that structuring it at those length scales impacts the transport of the carriers in the material. Um, so we're really excited about this project um, in the group. Um, this work has been made possible by a really, really fantastic um, team of researchers in the group. 
um, some of whom who are, you know, have, have been with the group for a couple of years and, and moved on and some who are just getting started in the group. Um, and so we have a, a really great group that is contributing to, to this work. We work with some um, very collaborative, collaborative um, partners at universities um, and government agencies. And um, we're very, very fortunate to have a diverse set of funding um, and to work with very supportive funding agencies. So I'd be happy at this time to, to take questions. Hopefully um, you'll have a bunch of questions that I can answer now. Um, and we have I'll a lot let, of questions. Uh, Ryan and... Okay, great. We, we <laughs> I don't know if that's good uh, or if I just didn't answer enough during the talk. Uh, no, 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 we're good. All right, so we, we are a little bit over time, but we promised a 10 minute live Q&A. Okay. So we are going to roll through uh, the full 10 minutes. Uh, so our first question um, was actually about um, the density of state charts um, from earlier in the talk. And the question was, how do the charts relate to the figure of merit for this work? Yeah, so the, um, so the density of states, I can, I'll see if I can pull it up. Um, but um, I'll try to to make it as simple as I can. Um, so basically, it's the slope of that density of states um, that will impact the CBEC coefficient. So if that slope changes significantly, you can significantly increase the, the CBEC coefficient. So when you have these nanostructures, and that's one aspect of how the density of states will um, improve, how the nanostructuring will improve the electrical um, characteristics of the material, but when you can change the density of states so that the slope is changing significantly, um, that will allow you to, to be able to get a larger feedback coefficient. Um, so, so that's one way that nanostructuring can be used to improve the thermoelectric um, material performance. Awesome. All right, so this, this question is a little bit uh, more intensive. All right, so Adding a thermoelectric to an industrial heat source will change the local heat transfer properties by adding thermal mass and reducing conductivity. Now something is warmer or colder than intended in the hopes of getting some bonus power. At what stage in the design cycle do you think about this? Will attaching to existing sources work or does this need to be done more holistically? I love that question. That's great. So th I'm, that's fantastic. So those are the analyses that I really love doing. It's somebody who's a mechanical engineer um, analyzing energy systems. Um, so it does depend on the application. And this is why um, targeting waste heat is, um, is a really exciting area for thermoelectrics. So um, you do, so I'll use automotive exhaust heat as a specific example to answer this question, but it can, it can apply to multiple applications. So for example, um, if you attach a thermoelectric um, into the exhaust stream um, of a, an automobile, um, it does change, right, the temperature of that exhaust. And the automobiles have been designed so that the catalytic converter um, that you pass the exhaust through before it comes out the end of the vehicle, um, that catalytic conversion is done at a specific temperature. So for example, you can't put the thermoelectric device, if you wanted to convert some of the heat in the exhaust to electricity, if you put that upstream of the catalytic converter, you will be changing the temperature of the gas that's going into the catalytic converter. Um, and then, you know, it might not be able to do um, that conversion. So it's true, you are changing the thermal character characteristics of the entire system when you're incorporating a thermoelectric device into it. Um, and so I didn't talk about any of that work that my group does, but we do these energy systems analyses that allow us to, to model um, incorporating a thermoelectric into an existing application and understand how much it would impact, say, thermal gradients um, in the application. Um, but there are a there there are a lot of applications where you could incorporate this, particularly if you have a waste heat stream where um, a, your, the downstream temperature of that stream, it doesn't really matter to you, um, then incorporating a thermoelectric might not actually significantly um, impact your, your process itself. Um, so it does depend, but you can do that with um, sometimes fairly simple heat transfer models. Okay. All right, so the next question, um, what is the heat electricity conversion efficiency? 
Yeah, so for thermoelectric devices, okay, so thermoelectric folks who might be watching this, I'm sure you're gonna, you know, throw their arms up. I'm gonna give rough ballparks, uh, so, so don't attack me for it. Um, so at a device level, um, about five to 10% efficiency. I would say is where we are, and I'd be a rough ballpark at a device level. At a materials level, that's a little bit better, um, and that's because at a device level you have these parasitic thermal and electrical resistances. At a material level, the efficiency, you know, I think is better. You can say that ballpark right now we're probably at 12 to 15 percent. I'm making broad generalizations there. Oh, sorry. How does sorry? that solar? How does that compare to? Solar power? So, uh, so solar power, is, it's the, the conversion efficiency is higher. Okay. Kind of in short. I mean, it depends on which technology you're using and all of that, but you know, solar, you're gonna get, um, broadly speaking, have a higher conversion efficiency than thermoelectrics right now. Cool. So next question is, uh, does the NP flip mean you can use the same material for both junctions? Um, so, uh, I'm not sure what that means by NP flip, um, but I'll try to try to answer that. Um, so traditionally, a uh, thermoelectric material is made with an N and a P N and a P material because if you make um, if you make that make it that way, um, you get this the doubling of the seabed coefficient. You get a bigger bang for your buck because you get to benefit from the seabed coefficient of the N-type and the P-type material. Um, and so that's why um, the devices are, are made with N and P-type material. I will say that um, even though people think of thermoelectrics this way, the thermoelectric effect doesn't depend on having an N and a P-type material. So you can make a device that only has one. Um, what you're sacrificing there is the overall feedback coefficient um, that you're getting you know, for the entire device. Um, but it's possible to make it with just N um, or P. I'm not sure where the person asking that question is going in terms of like an N and a P flip related to laser additive manufacturing. Um, if they wanted to clarify it, I could maybe answer that better, but hopefully that answered it. So the question was from uh, Jason uh, Kralish. So potentially maybe like offline uh, later you two could connect. Um, our next yeah, question absolutely. is from uh, Ghanem. Um, and so the question is how much energy is saved by laser printing thermoelectric materials per unit volume compared to letting heat be dissipated? Um, so let me try to understand. Um, so uh, the question might be, you know, how, how much energy are you saving? Um, by having a thermoelectric versus not having a thermoelectric. Um, so if, if that's the question, then um, you get that from the conversion efficiency. So if you had a heat source um, and you did nothing with that heat, then you don't get any, anything for it. If you um, attach a thermoelectric device to that heat source, um, then typically the conversion efficiency is about 5%. So 5% of that heat would get converted into electricity, five to 10%, depending, you know, depending on you know, factors of um, the device and, and the system integration. Um, so I'm not sure if that's where the question was going, um, but uh, that's the answer to that. If the question was on um, laser additive manufacturing, like the heat dissipation during laser additive manufacturing, um, you know, how does that compare to other techniques? Uh, we haven't actually done um, that comparison, um, but it's, it's certainly something that I'd be interested in looking at. Okay, all right, so our next question is from uh, Raphael uh, Sadler. The question is how additive manufacturing can improve the thermoelectric materials related to ocean energy conversion? And if you were talking about that particular application, what material would you suggest? Yeah, um, so, uh, so you choose the thermoelectric material um, based off, so this the ZT, the figure of merit that you see in the screen in front of you, um, it's got T, so it's got the temperature in it, 
But though all of those material properties are temperature dependent. So you typically choose the thermoelectric material based on which material is gonna have the best combination of properties at the temperature of the application. Um, so in the, the marine applications, um, and I'm not a, an expert at this, uh, but in the marine applications, um, you, your temperature gradient um, is going to be occurring, usually what you're doing is you're, you're doing it between the water and then either the gradient within the water, so different depths of the water, or the water and um, the air above the surface. Um, and so it depends on where you're doing it, right? So if you're doing it in the Arctic, um, you're gonna have a, a different temperature gradient available to you compared to, um, you know, off the coast of, the, of Florida, for example. Um, so it depends on, on the gradient. So it depends on the, the temperature and the, the gradient that you have available to you in terms of which material you would choose. Um, there, I can, if somebody wants to contact me offline, I can, refer you to kind of what materials you would choose for different types of, you know, different ranges of temperatures. Um, in terms of why additive manufacturing for, um, for marine thermoelectric conversion, uh, what I would say there is additive manufacturing allows us to really free up the geometry of the device. So our design space is a lot larger. We are now able to think about um, designing the thermoelectric, we, we have a way to make the thermoelectric in case you have a lot of, say, serpentine piping um, that you're using in a marine environment. Typically, it's hard to incorporate a traditional thermoelectric on that because a the thermoelectric is rigid and planar. But with additive manufacturing, you can think about making the device so that it can wrap around the piping that you might have um, in your system. And, and that's where I think the real benefit of an additive manufacturing approach is. Great, all right, so the last question I think we're gonna take just in the interest of time uh, is from Michael Restaino. The question is, do you have any potential approaches for reducing the print, your printed structure's void volume? Yeah, so, um, we actually have a couple of projects starting up um, this year where we are using, so void volume, um, I'm gonna assume that they're talking about the porosity in the part. So we're at around 85%, which is it's fairly porous um, from a thermoelectric perspective, as well as making a part with additive manufacturing. Um, and so we want to try to make that part as dense as possible. So we wanna move that 85% closer to 100%. And we wanna do that by reducing the pores in the material. And so you have to really understand what's happening in the process and how to control the process to minimize the pores that are formed in the material. So we actually have a couple of projects starting up um, with collaborators. Um, where um, we are gonna be using machine learning to um, analyze what the poor formation while we're processing the material and then tune the processing parameters so that we can minimize that poor formation. And the machine learning approach um, should allow us to, to do this kind of iterative feedback um, much faster than a typical design of experiments. And so um, we're, we're gonna be starting on that uh, later this year and hope to be able to use the integration of machine learning into the processing to um, allow us to reduce the, the porosity and get to higher density. Great. All right, so I think we're gonna end it there. Um, I think for other questions, um, please feel free to reach out to uh, Dr. LeBlanc. Um, we're gonna be adding uh, a link to, the web, to her website uh, in the, um, oh, and also on this slide is information to contact her. Uh, thank you so much. That was a great talk. And thank you for staying with us for some extra time. Uh, and uh, we really, really enjoyed it. And next week we're gonna have Ruben Acevedo presenting on 3D nanoprinted microcapsules for drug delivery. But until then, we hope you're all well. Okay, that is it. Bye, everyone.